Good evening. Oh, you can do better than that. Good evening. That's better. Brother Danny, I believe I showed up. On behalf of the vision team and stewardship committee, Perry Patterson and James Gordon of Patterson and Gordon Architects, we welcome you to this service and the presentation. And before we start, <clears throat> I know everybody wants to get to the pictures, you know, and all this stuff, but we need to hear a little bit from God's Word, and I have some scriptures we uh, want to look at, and I'll not take no more time than, than God leads me. How's that? If you will, take your Bibles. If you don't have one, there's one in the pew. Because I want you to be able to follow along with these scriptures. In Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 6, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. And then hold your finger there when you find that. And then turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 4 and 5 as I close. While you're turning, I'd like to say that for the last 16 months, these other eight people down here, we've been like family. We began meeting once a week in January of 2012. And then we moved to two meetings. And here recently, we've of course gone back to one. But I love each one of these guys and gals, I'm gonna say it that way, in the Lord. We've become very close. And I appreciate each and every one of them. I'd like to say that Michelle Wagner has been our recording secretary and she has done a super job keeping up with the minutes. I didn't count them, but I think my stack's about a half inch thick and that's right much for notebook paper. And then Gailene Cox is our chairperson and she has truly been a jewel to this committee. She has scheduled all the meetings. And when we began interviewing the different ministries of this church, she worked with her time schedule and ours to, to work it out. And it took weeks to do that. As Joel Carter would put it, she's kept the peanut butter between the crackers. <laughs> He's a nice one. <laughs> These scripture verses was in our Sunday school lesson about three weeks ago. And after I taught that lesson, I couldn't get away from these scriptures. I'd wake up and they'd be on my mind and during the day when I'd be doing chores around the house, they'd be on my mind. And I thought, Lord, why? Why is that? You know? And then sometime later I found out I was going to do the opening tonight and I thought, well, I need some scripture. And I thought, I've got it. God was trying to tell me then that I was going to reuse these verses. In that Sunday school lesson that Sunday, I asked the class, I said, do you trust God? Do you truly trust it? with every avenue of your life. You trusted him for salvation, but do you trust him for every other aspect? I want to re-ask that question here again tonight. But I want to rephrase it. Do we trust God in every avenue of our life? Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. I believe this vision team has done that. When we begin, we said we want to know God's will. And we said one thing this team needs to do is to pray. And we just didn't pray when we met, but we prayed when we weren't meeting. 
We used electronic media to correspond back and forth. And Guy Lane always encouraged this group to pray, pray, pray. You could not emphasize that too much. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. This team wanted to know God's will and his understanding, not ours. In verse 7, it says, Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not wise. The Bible tells you if you want wisdom, ask it of God. Ask it of God. And acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. And I believe God has directed this vision team during this 16 months. Verse 8 says, it shall be healthy. Or verse 7 says, be not wise in thy own understand, on thy, in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. I believe this fear of the Lord here is not that we're to be afraid of God, but there we respect, we are to respect Him and to honor Him and to serve Him. And we as a church family should not take the growth of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church by granted because where this church has been growing others has been declining verse 8 says it shall be healthy to thy navel and more to thy bones that word navel means central point and I believe the writer in Proverbs here is telling us that God is to be the central point of our Christian lives he is the one that is to lead us and to guide us, and he is the one is we are to look to to make decisions. You know, the Lord instructed the head of every Israelite family to post the Shema upon their doorpost. That word Shema means listen. And now if you'll look over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and 5, you'll see what they posted up on their doorpost. God wanted them to do that so they would not forget Him. You know, we get busy every day about our different chores that we do. We work, and those that's retired have got things they do, and in the hustle and bustle and time, we forget God a lot of times, don't we? But He should be the central point in our lives. He should be the first thing we look to of a morning and the last thing at night and everything we look to during the day. Here he posted, they posted up on their doorpost in verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Let's go back up to verse 4 as I close. And here where it says Israel, place your name in the place of the word Israel. Now don't go out of here and tell everybody I'm trying to change the word of God. I'm using this for an illustration. And after you do that, let's place our church family in the place where it says Israel. And if we do that, it will read like this. Hear, O Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, the Lord our God is one Lord. Before I pray, I want to have a moment of silence. And this moment of silence is to remember those that have gone on to be with the Lord, that has served on building committees and building projects in this church. And for those that established Pleasant Hill Baptist Church back in 1897, they had a vision then. And then it's to honor those that, have, that are still living. Some of you are here tonight that have served on building programs that built the educational buildings, 
built the educational and office places to my right outside. Many of you here served, and then those that are serving now. And then after that moment of silence, I'm going to close in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for the forefathers that built this church. Thank you for those who have served and who had a vision in the past. We thank you for those who are serving now and carrying on that vision. God, we pray tonight that as Perry comes and James comes and presents a presentation of Every person on this vision team has had some sort of input in what will be shown here tonight. That God, we believe this is your will and your direction for Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And our prayer is that your will will be done. And whatever is accomplished here tonight, we give your son the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, Hank, or I, I think they won't take up an offering now, I think. And uh, if Hank or somebody will come and play, we'll do that.
In July of 1972, John and I married and moved into our first home right across the street. We lived in a mobile home owned by um, Webb and Gypsy Settle. We both belonged to, to much smaller churches than Pleasant Hill, and to be honest, we were a little intimidated about coming over here to this big church. And we had no family. We really didn't know many people here. So we continued going to our, uh, the churches we were raised in, or, or maybe some Sundays just, just not going at all. You know how that is when you're newly married and away from home. Well, soon school started, and I began my first teaching job at CBL, or where I met some women who, who were members here at Pleasant Hill. Well, one was Nora Carter, and I see her sitting back here tonight. And uh, she so graciously befri befriended me and, and invited me to church, and, and even the following summer invited me before I'd even joined to, to help in Bible school. And, you know, folks, you never forget the kindness that people show you, do you? And, and it just shows how important it is when you need a home, a home church to, uh, to be gracious and, and friendly to other people. Well, we had a lot of others who, who visited and invited us to church here, so we soon made our way over here, and we, we soon found out that this church was much like the churches of our childhood, very warm and friendly and, and folks that had the same beliefs as John and I. We eventually joined and became active members. Uh, we raised our two boys here, and you know it's hard to believe that we've been enjoying the blessings of this church for almost 41 years. And I really don't believe it was a coincidence that our first home was across the street from this church. And I look out tonight at uh, so many people here, and some of you were already members here when John and I came, and, and some of you have been here about the same amount of time, and, and some of you are younger members, and, and you know the Lord has led you to this church. But I dare say that, that Pleasant Hill Baptist Church has been a blessing to every person who, who is part of this church. Well, several years ago, some of our members compiled this booklet. Any of you remember this booklet? <laughs> it highlights the history of our church from 1897 through 1979. Well, I read it at the time, and I, I kind of put it aside. I was busy raising babies back then and didn't think too much about it uh, until a couple of weeks ago. The architects told me that a few of the vision team members should talk about the why part of the master plan. And that's certainly a question that everyone needs an answer to in order to know how to, how to vote for the plan coming up June the 2nd. Well, the Lord just impressed this, this booklet on my mind and fortunately I was able to locate it. And when I opened it and read the introduction, it was as if I was reading something that I had written myself for the vision team presentation tonight. So thank you, uh, Pat and Gary and Ann and Doug, Ronnie and Rexana and Stoney and Sarah for, for all the work you put into this booklet over 30 years ago. And now I'm gonna share that introduction with you And by the way, the first page says, to God be the glory, important words. And it reads, founded on and grounded in the word of God, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church has marched forward over the years. The church under the Lord's leadership experienced and continues to experience growth and unmeasurable God-given blessings. God has worked greatly through the leadership and membership of this local New Testament body. Continuing growth brings with it many needs, needs for more facilities and enlargement of the present. It widens the vision of the desire for greater outreach and implementation of outreach programs. God has provided from the founding to the present, able and dedicated under shepherds to preach his word without fear or reservation, and to lead his congregation to meet the challenges and needs of the day. The pages in here, it says, cannot begin to contain the countless blessings God has poured out on this congregation during the pastorate of each capable under shepherd. And fortunately tonight, we have a young man here with us who is going to share 
the pictures, some of the pictures that are in here, uh, and additional ones too that just speak to the history of our church from its founding to the present. So uh, Jason Couch, he's also a member of the Stewardship Committee. If you will come now. As we look at the following pictures, I would encourage us to think about how God has richly blessed Pleasant Hill from our humble beginnings uh, to the present day and how the ministries of our church have grown. In this first image, uh, the night of March the 7th, 1897, 116 years ago, a group of Christian men and women met in the home of Jones and Julie Darnell in the Pleasant Hill community for the purpose of organizing a church. In October of that same year, the lot where the present church is now located was purchased. Meetings were held in homes and in a brush arbor until the new building was finished. The white frame structure was dedicated on May 24, 1903. It seated about 300 people and cost $1,490 to build. <laughs> it, <laughs> that was a lot of money to those folks. It was enlarged twice to accommodate the growth of the church. In 1938, a group of men watched Charlie Day drive a corner stake into the ground for the new church building about to be built, the sanctuary we are now sitting in. Ground was broken on the new building as shown in this September 1938 edition of the Chatham Blanketeer. Membership had grown to 420 at this time. A quote from this article reads, the present membership is not trying to build a church above its means. They only hope to build one to take care of the needs in this community. The church is being built entirely by the people with the help of the Lord. Here's a closer view of the basement being dug for the new building. The old church can be seen in the background. The new building was completed in 1940 at a cost of $14,000. The debt was fully paid off by 1943 However, the dedication was postponed until 1947 when all the World War II veterans had returned home from service. The men's chorus is pictured here in the choir loft in the late 1940s. Reverend David Day is on the right there in front of the piano. The children of the church and the community are shown here during a vocation Bible school in the late 1940s. And this view from the balcony shows the interior of this sanctuary in the late 1960s. A group of ladies, we're not sure exactly which group here, are pictured on the front steps with Reverend Robert Tenry in the late 1960s. Likewise, a group of men, possibly a Sunday school class, are also shown with Reverend Tenry on the front steps. On June 26, 1960, ground was broken on the educational building behind the sanctuary. It was completed one year later by June of 1961. In 1969, major renovations to the church building were undertaken, which included replacing the old steeple with the one we have today. This picture was taken in December 1970. At the pinnacle of the steeple is a copper plate etched with the words, To God Be the Glory. These renovations also remodeled the sanctuary and choir loft and changed the front entrance. The church was painted white at this time, which gives us the building that we presently use for worship. And here's a color view of the same building after renovations were completed. On Sunday morning, February 26, 1978, under the leadership of Reverend W.T. Furr, who's a third from the left there, a groundbreaking service was held for the new educational building. And Preacher Furr went home to be with the Lord just eight days later. Progress on the new educational building continued. The new building was first occupied for Sunday school on July the 1st, 1979. The cost for the project was approximately $317,000. And this brings us up to the present as far as the history of our buildings are concerned. However, we know we're not about buildings, but about ministry. This view from the late 1970s demonstrates one of the great ministries of this church, our Vacation Bible School. The last picture we'd like to share is from about 1970. 
This view taken from the baptistry shows the church pews filled to capacity. A scene similar to this would be viewed today if we were all packed in here from both services, similar to our second service this morning if you were here. And we will close with this thought that comes to mind from this picture. Now is our time. What are we going to do for the Lord? Thank you, Jason, so much for sharing those pictures. You know, folks, the pages in this booklet captures the visions that our forefathers had and, and the sacrifices they made to build and enlarge as the membership grew. And we know they express the unwavering faith that God would meet all their needs. And because of what they were able to accomplish with God's help, we're able to sit here tonight enjoying this beautiful, comfortable sanctuary. You know, as followers of Christ, it's good to have that tangible evidence of God's help in the past, isn't it? These mementos help remind us of his faithfulness and that it continues today and that we can follow him confidently into the future, whatever the future brings. And as you all know, today Pleasant Hill is experiencing growth through the leadership of our wonderful pastor, Danny Dodds. Our attendance has increased to the point where we're, we now have two morning services. We've added many new ministries for which we need more space. Our fellowship hall is bursting at the seams when we have get-togethers. And it's such an exciting time in our church as we grow. And we're growing not only numerically, but spiritually, which is most important. But with this growth comes the need for additional facilities. And that's why in the fall of 2011, Brother Danny asked the Committee on Committees to put together a vision team to help him evaluate our current ministries and to formulate a plan for the future of our church. His charge to us was to see how we are going about our ministries. What can we do to improve in the future to ensure that our ministries are fulfilling the Great Commission? Our job was to look at finances, space, parking, daycare, all the ministries of the church. Then research and recommend someone to do the projects and then communicate our findings to the church and let you all make the decisions. Well, in January of 2012, we began our job of seeking God's will for Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And as Larry said, we, we met many, many times. And so let's just fast forward to 16 months later, and, and here we are ready to show you the master plan that we believe is God's will for our church. And folks, this is the result of many, many prayers, many, many meetings interviews of ministry lead, team leaders, uh, visits to other churches, interviews with architects to determine the best ones for Pleasant Hill. I know the pastor and, and Danny have given you some updates periodically on what's going on with the vision team, but tonight there's really not enough time. There's no way I could really convey to you all that has happened to bring us where we are tonight. But I can tell you this, each member of the vision team has taken their responsibility seriously and has truly sought God's will for our church. And at this time, I want to recognize each member of the vision team. And as they stand, they are affirming that we are unanimous in our belief that this master plan is the master's plan for Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. So folks, would you please stand? This is our vision team. Their names are listed in your bulletin. I'm sure you know them all. But I just thank God for each and every one of them and what they've meant during this time. It's been such a, a joy to work with them. And Danny, would you stand too, please? Danny's also been a part of, of this team, a very valuable part. Well, now I want to introduce you to two men who've worked tirelessly with us to develop this master plan that I know you're chomping at the bits to see. 
and I just don't have enough adjectives in my vocabulary to adequately describe them. Uh, some that come to mind, knowledgeable, professional, patient, uh, easy to work with, they're just, they're godly men. Uh, we said at the outset that, that whoever did our work for us, we wanted to be Christians. And I don't, I really believe that they have looked at the last six months that they have worked with us as more than just a job. They've looked at it as an opportunity to serve the Lord and to serve our church. And uh, I would like for Perry Peterson to stand, please. And James Gordon, his sidekick. And let's give them a warm, pleasant hill welcome. Okay. The show is all yours now, gentlemen. Ah, good evening. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And I'm going to start out tonight with the easiest thing I have to do. And that's just to say thank you to the vision team and to the church for allowing us to be a part of this project. That it's just for an architect to basically come in and work with a church that wants to sincerely increase programs and reach more people. It's just a terrific thing for us to be a part of. So, so we love every second of it, and I, I hope that comes out in our presentation tonight, too. But uh, what we start out doing when we do a master plan is we collect a lot of da data. We have to find out how many people are in every Sunday school classroom and, and everything going on in the church. And we spend a good period of time collecting this data. Once we have this data, then we analyze it. And we think kind of architecturally, which, which I'm not going to try to describe what that really is tonight because you would think we need some counseling and some help. But in doing so, then we design things. And once we've designed these things, the way we approach it, we say there's not one solution to any problem or anything we're looking at, that there's more than one way to do things. So what we do is uncover different ways of doing things, and then we present them to the vision team. And what we charge the vision team with is saying, okay, you represent all the folks attending church here. We want you to make the best decisions on what everybody that here is tonight is going to hear, and hopefully you like what they've come up with. So at this point, though, we're going to pretty much skip to the results and show you what we've come up with. And we're going to start out with a few of the topics that, that we've uh, dealt with. First of all, we want to provide facilities to allow the church programs to grow. And that means we have to go from as many people are showing up now to five to ten years out. We have to determine if the current campus site is adequate for growth. That was one of the, the biggest questions on the vision team initially was, can we stay here? Or is what we're trying to do too big that we can do it here? So we had to kind of look at that and, and deal with that and figure that out. And then we decided to create a phased, balanced development plan because anytime you're trying to do something extremely large, the only way to do it nowadays and it's usually finances are the thing that make this happen, is to do it in stages and steps so that you can kind of have things grow and have more people come to church, and with more people, then you can do more things. So, so that was how we were looking at things, and we'll get into that a little further too. And then finally, we would determine a probable cost for in implementing this master plan that we kind of start day one and say we always work to a budget that we don't want to do something that can't be done. And we think God has plenty of room to do some incredible things, but we want to make sure that it can be done. So, so we, we try to make sure that, that we feel like we're presenting something that the church can take on and do. One of the things early on we explained to the vision team was that we see the church kind of as a three-legged stool that we have worship, we have education, and we have fellowship. And what we try to do is keep that three-legged stool balanced so that if one leg gets too long or too short, basically that stool isn't stable. So you could imagine if you had 1,200 people here worshiping, and then you had a fellowship event in the current fellowship hall that seats about 130 people, 
that there'd be, you know, probably close to 900 people that couldn't attend something going on, and, and that would just be totally out of balance. Same thing is true, for instance, if you had 12, 1,300 people coming to worship and the Sunday school class space was only enough for 300 people. All of a sudden, then you've got 900 people that can't come to Sunday school, and, and that's just, just would be a shame. And what happens is, when it's not in balance, people are going to go find somewhere where it is. So, so we suggest keeping everything in balance and, and progressing in a manner like that. The good news is that the current church, we actually have enough space for Sunday school. We just have to do it differently as far as where we're putting things. The sanctuary has to be larger, and naturally the fellowship hall. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to pick on the fellowship hall tonight because it's probably the most out-of-balance thing in here. <laughs> so it, it's going to get picked on. But another thing we did during master planning was growth projections that we have to figure out currently how many people are showing up, but what's going to happen in the next five to ten years? And what we projected is currently worship, which by the numbers I've been hearing from Pastor Danny, my numbers are, are way too low even tonight, but back when we started it was about 450 people, and that's the seating capacity of, of the sanctuary. What we'd like to see is in five to ten years to be able to seat 940 people as kind of the upper end, and then we give the second number, 750. That's about 80% full, which is typically the more comfortable that everybody in here will have plenty of room to move around and, and feel comfortable. So those are the numbers that, that kind of go for our worship portion. Okay, then education. Currently there's room for about 315 people to attend Sunday school. What we would grow that to is 525 people. And most churches, the ones we work with, usually about 70% of the congregation that comes to worship is in a, in a Sunday school class. So that's where that number, basically the 525, comes from. We basically said that we need to have capacity for that many people to come to Sunday school. And then fellowship. We go from 133 to being able to take care of five to 600 people at a time. And you can kind of see that this education number and the fellowship number aren't too far off, that most everything you do, just like tonight, you'll see about 70% of the folks actually come. So, so that's why we say that number is actually in balance. Now, what we're proposing is a phased approach, and I'm going to use, hopefully use a pointer up here, that we show kind of in this orange color is the first phase, then the portion, second portion of the first phase is what we do to the existing building. And then the second phase of work is actually what we do for worship. And so we're going to take on each piece kind of one at a time and go through those and show you what each is. But we do start with phase 1A, which is the orange piece. And what this is is basically a new Family Life Center. And the Family Life Center is about 12,000 square feet, so it's a rather big building. But basically, this would take care of all the fellowship needs of the church and also quite a few programs, too, in, in addition. It also is, is going to be very important when we go to do phase two that there's going to be a period of time where we have to work in this space while where we're sitting is actually being built. And now we've got a little 3D shot of actually this Family Life Center and hopefully you can see that right in here is the current kind of there's a little classroom here and then the fellowship hall kitchen is right in here. But what we're proposing to do is to actually add to the lower level of the church behind the church. And to do so, we have to add quite a bit of dirt. And what, what Dale reminded me at about the, I think it was about the second meeting, he said, well, well you know, in Elkin, there's nothing flat. <laughs> and so basically we said, that, that is true, and, and that's one of our jobs as architects is we can take something that's not flat and make it flat. So what we're looking at is to actually put it down at the same level as the lower level. 
we're trying to make everything very accessible to all handicapped folks so that we don't have any barriers for, for folks to come to church. So, so that's why this particular building is going at that level. We also show a covered drop-off so that when it is raining, kind of like tonight might be when we leave, that actually there's a place to get out of the weather. But this building is a rather large mass, and actually if you put it up against these buildings up in front, it'd be a good bit taller and a good bit wider. So actually it's a good place is to put it in back where it's not as obtrusive. And here's a shot of what the front entrance really, kind of more what it would look like. We're kind of keying on the colors of the church and things of that nature, but, but showing kind of a nice covered area, a nice lobby behind so that as folks come in to use the facility, there's, there's plenty of room to welcome folks. Now one thing to, to kind of caution you, these aren't finished construction drawings or anything like that. These are just what something could be, so we want to look at it in those terms. We do have a diagram, though, that shows kind of what's going on. The main space of this Family Life Center is equivalent where you could play a high school basketball game, that, it, that the space is large enough for that. It also has a large area for spectators. So, for instance, if, if something like uh, you had upward basketball or something like that, all the parents and grandparents would, would actually be able to attend and watch the children play. This will also be used, for instance, after Awana's over, the kids will kind of come through and come into the big space and, and they'll actually have activities and then disperse from there. The connection that I was talking about at the existing building is right down here at the bottom that there will be a nice hallway that leads directly into the lobby. We have restroom facilities and then beyond it we also have a commercial kitchen. Now when you bring five or six hundred people to eat, we've got to be able to cook for them because they're not going to be too happy if we don't have, have good food. So we have a large commercial kitchen with, a, with pantry and dish room. We also include, always in these buildings, a rather large storage room. And what we want to be able to do in this, this room to make it as flexible as possible is to have it to where it can be cleared entirely, that all the chairs, tables, everything can be out of the room and be stored. So nobody, you've been in spaces where you see all the chairs and tables kind of scattered around the space and it just doesn't look kept. So, so we put a storage room kind of in that area to take care of that. Now right now, we're not showing a permanent stage, but for instance, if down the road a building committee said that was something that we had to have, it's very easy to update kind of this little diagram and put something like that in. But right now, we're not showing something like that. And here's a, just a little shot of another Baptist church in our local area that this is a shot of upward basketball on a Saturday morning. And this is the kind of space that we would look, look for for a family life center. Large volume, and actually this one does have a stage, but it's covered up when it's basketball time. But just look at the number of people. It's amazing how many people show up. And in this case, this church wanted to be the the center of the community for just about all the activities they could, that they felt like there was no better place than the church. So can you see this as being something that, that Pleasant Hill could actually take on, being the center of the community? With a space like this, these things are possible, so it's, it's just a terrific thing. Then could you picture this? Could you picture the five or six hundred people sitting down at a meal? This is another space but it's the same concept, basically large volume space, and this actually is 500 people sitting down at a meal. And for instance, Wednesday night, have a meal, then all these people turn around and attend a Bible study. That'd be a terrific thing to have that many people be at a Bible study. And then we give a shot kind of a, of a commercial kitchen and we make it large enough to cook for all these people. And we had a church, it was interesting, the, the, one of the ladies on the committee said, well, what if I just want to make some cookies? Because the big, mean, stainless steel things don't look good for making cookies. So we put her a little residential oven right next to all the commercial things <laughs> so she could make cookies. 
But that's the fun part about what we do. We can design things to, to whatever y'all, whatever makes sense to y'all will make sense to us, and we'll do it. So, so we have a lot of fun with that. And also, we, we'd kind of shown that, that there is going to be a period of time where we're suggesting where you have to worship in this space. And the first space I showed with the kids playing basketball, this is what it looks like when they open the curtains up and do service. And you couldn't, could never get from that basketball shot to here and think it could be that nice or that different. But that's how this multi-purpose space, how many different things it can do. And for instance, just about every one of these spaces we've, we've done, seven days a week, something is going on. It's probably going to be the most used space in the entire church. And, and it's just amazing some of the different things that, that can, can happen. And it'll touch every age group in the church that this particular crowd there's certain days of the week that actually some of the older folks and I'm getting to be that kind of older folks I can get away with saying this now but but they actually come in they have a little Bible study and then they walk around the space and and do some exercise classes so there's just a tremendous amount of things that can be done in a space like this okay now we're gonna kind of switch gears and phase 1B, still part of the first phase, but 1B is actually what we're going to do in the existing buildings. And I'm going to have my partner, James Gordon, come up and do this portion and present what we propose for what to happen in the existing building. Otherwise known as uh, his sidekick. So if this thing doesn't work, there it goes. Uh, it's clicking in for us. Um, when Perry told me what he wanted me to do tonight, he said, uh, he said, I'm going to take the, uh, the, the, the new building and the new building, and I'm going to give you the renovation portion. So, so that's what I'm going to cover tonight. Here's the good news. Um, the, the good news is that, is that as we were looking at a master plan, um, we figured that you really have the amount of space you need uh, in this building to actually do Sunday school space to handle your... 750 to 940 coming for worship. And that's good news. The, 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 the bad news is that it really needs to be redistributed. Needs to be. We, we said we wanted to do three things, really, um, in terms of the master plan for the renovation. We wanted to get the right amount of space, which you have. We wanted it to be in the right place. And we wanted it to be for the right ages. So we... In the, now, now, understand, this is, this is the architect's viewpoint of it. Um, so if we're moving classrooms around, you know, you, you, you can pin me to the wall afterwards, okay? Uh, but uh, but our, our idea was to, to, to get the right age groups at the right places in the church to make it work uh, better than it does right now. One of the things that we looked at, just to give you an idea of, uh, of, of planning for growth which was another thing that we were trying to do, um, was, was we were not just, not just trying to take care of a certain number of people, but you've got to have more classrooms. Does that make sense? So whereas you have about 25 classrooms now that you're using as classrooms, uh, you've got a lot of other rooms uh, that, that, that you're using for different things, but 25 classrooms... Um, you really need to get up to about 37 or 38. So it's about 50% more classrooms. That, that's, that's about what we're looking at uh, to provide uh, in here. And just to give you an idea of the space amount that's required to do it, for your preschool, if you're going to service that 525 number that Perry showed you earlier, um, uh, for, for, for overall people coming to Sunday school, uh, you're going to go from 1,000 square feet to 2,000. For children's ministries, you're going to go from 2,000 to 3,000 square feet. From, for, for youth, you're going to go from 1,000 to 2,000. And for adult, well, you have, um, you're, you're using about 6,000 square feet, but a lot of what you're using is here in the sanctuary. So we want to provide Sunday school space that doesn't necessarily interfere with sanctuary prep and Sunday morning use of sanctuary. Does that make sense? So those are some of our goals of what we are trying to do. 
So let me show you some of the diagrams, and then we'll get to some pretty pictures. Uh, Perry talked about the new, uh, the, the new Family Life Center, and that connection's right there. Here's where your existing fellowship hall is. And what we would like to do in terms of getting the right ages at the right place with the right grouping is to make these adult classrooms down here. Um, your, your, your fellowship hall is gro grossly undersized, but we've taken care of that in terms of building new fellowship space. So after we do that, then we can take the fellowship hall and turn it into, you know, three classrooms. One of those classrooms being adult one world changers. But the nice thing is that we can separate it and keep the kitchen here so you can use it for other things as well. So on this floor, we have, uh, you know, we, we, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight classrooms, eight adult classrooms in a group. So you notice we're not going to be mixing different age groups on a floor. We're going to try to keep them all together like that. Now, staying on the bottom floor, in the basement floor, um, we would like or we would propose that you move all your nursery and preschool there. Now, North Carolina uh, building code really, really strongly <laughs> suggests that you get the youngest people on a grade level. In other words, not to be above the ground, just so it's safe in case there's a fire or disaster or something like that. They want to get children out first. So we would propose that you take pretty much that whole floor, and you can imagine everything down there in the basement level underneath the education wing back there, um, and, and turn it into uh, six very nice, very large uh, nursery and preschool classrooms. Now, in the future, you would have, you know, two nurseries two pre uh, and, and four preschools, two preschool one age and two preschool two age uh, groups in there. You'd also have some, some, some bathrooms relative to that. You'd have a nice area for parents to come and check in their kids, and you've got three different areas where they can check in kids, and it'll, it, it'll make it so much smoother for parents with kids. Uh, on a Sunday morning or for any other activity um, that you're trying to do. And let me just say right here, since we don't have the diagram for this building and for what, where your current children's classrooms are, since they're the next age group up, what we would suggest is you spend some money, not, not a tremendous amount, but some money in the basement of this building underneath the, the room that we're in uh, on your children's classrooms to make the rooms better organized, a little bit bigger, um, and, and, and maybe take down some of the dividing walls in it because um, we think it will allow you to grow in the interim before you build a new sanctuary and new children's classrooms. Does that make sense? So back on the main floor, right directly across over here where the, where, where the pastor's offices are, uh, we're going to keep that building intact just like it is. Um, and we'll keep all the offices, and uh, in fact, we'll move the, the, the library back here, um, back in this space, and, and, and it'll, it'll work very, very nicely there, kind of at a central point. And we'll keep pretty much the adult classrooms that are there. We'll keep those classrooms there, uh, adult four uh, classrooms. That, that Our idea is the older the adult groups are, the closer to the sanctuary they need to be. And, and, and that's just from an architect's perspective. Now this is the floor directly behind us back here. And you'll notice what we're doing is we're taking all this area in the future. Now, your choir room uh, sits right about in here. And your choir room would stay until such a time as you built the new sanctuary in phase two. Um, and so... Instead of having 37 classrooms that we're shooting for eventually, you'd have 33. So you'd be going from 20, 24, uh, 25 classrooms uh, up, to, up to about 33 immediately when we renovate uh, all, these, uh, all this space. Now, one of the nice things that we would strongly suggest that you do anyway is go ahead, we'd reroute this corridor that goes between the two stairways. And, uh, and, and take most of that space for men's and women's uh, restrooms back there and then reroute the corridor all the way around. Uh, and, and we think that's something that's, uh, nothing's ever easy, 
but we think it's very doable, and we think it'll greatly enhance the way you, uh, you, you, uh, you function in those spaces. Now, what are we going to do with the third floor? Well, it's our strong suggestion, once again, that you don't mix groups. We would like to take that whole floor and make it the youth floor. And uh, we think that you can get a nice big youth assembly space. That's one of the target things that we would like to see uh, when, when, when phase two and you know, phase 1A, phase 1, 1A, and 2 is finally built, is that you have for the different age groups, for, uh, for, for children, for youth, and for adult classrooms, is to have assembly space as well. So, so you'd have breakout classrooms for the youth, uh, youth assembly. You'd also have a youth game room and kitchen. Um, you know, so you can do a lot with that space up there. Um, and we think that once again, that's that's well doable. Now, just we just like to show pictures. Here's a church that we worked with in uh, in Wake Forest, and here's what they did. You know, for their youth, that may be not the colors that you would pick for your house, um, but boy, it certainly worked for them. Uh, I mean, it was bright, and it was cheery, and it was their space. It wasn't used for anything else, and, and, uh, and we certainly think that that's a, that's a neat thing. In this space, they had an assembly area, but they also had, you know, kind of a sit-down coffee, not coffee, but, you know, snacks and, and, you know, some booths like you would have a little restaurant. They had a stage area. They had, uh, you know, uh, air hockey and, and, and ping pong off to the side. Uh, and, and you may or may not do some of those functions up there, but, but bottom line is you want a space that specifically meets the ministry needs of a specific age group. So that's what we're trying to do. Going back through our, uh, go, going back through our list of things we were trying to do, we were trying to get the right amount of people in the right place for the right age group. We were trying to plan for growth, and we were trying to maximize the use of the existing facility that you have so that we're not building new Sunday school space, we're reorganizing it. And we feel like we can do it in stages. That's why you have to build the new building first is so that you have space to move people to while you're renovating a certain area. And, and, and it would take a little while to do that. Well, I, I actually thought I was giving James a good thing to present, but I guess he's proven me wrong. But uh, now we're going to jump to actually phase two, and, and this by far was the most difficult decision on the entire realm of things that we looked at, because even seeing tonight the pictures of the, the old church sanctuary kind of being built and everything, it's just kind of an emotional thing to see something like that. But in this case, the committee kind of grappled with that, discussed it many ways, and actually the recommendation is to actually, in phase two, raise this building and build a new sanctuary. So that, that would be the phase two piece. And what would be actually below it would be the children's area, too, which would all be brand new. And we're showing the 3D of this. That's this piece right in here we're doing a couple things before we we're also talking about we had to try to fit it on this site and we've got basically cemetery right up to the buildings just about and we're really tight on space so so one of the things we'll show in the diagram we had to turn the sanctuary 90 degrees so tonight you're sitting facing me like this when phase two is built you'll actually be facing to the east so you'll be turned 90 degrees and actually when you come in here, now you're coming into the sanctuary. When, when we see the diagram of this, there's actually a back hallway, so you don't come in the front of the sanctuary when you come in here. So, so a lot of these changes are going to make a lot of sense and make things work out a whole lot better. But also in this 3D, we're showing basically a, a brand new front entrance and a covered walk that leads between the church office and the sanctuary. So basically, we'll be able to come in and on pretty days be out of the sun and be able to have a little bit of fellowship too before you enter, enter the building. We have also have, have a large kind of lobby area to, to enter the building. But we're going to go ahead and take a look. And actually, I think from what I heard, Pastor Danny promised that we're going to fly around this thing. 
So we didn't want him to uh, to actually be not be doing it. Okay, come on, fly around. Huh. Well, it flew around yesterday. Here we go. Is it going? Oh. Now we will fly around. And we're zooming in now on the new front entrance. We've got the ramp and then a covered connection. We're increasing the parking back in this area. Entrance to the fellowship or family life center. And look at the size of the family life center kind of in relation to everything. It's a huge space. The kitchen is actually back in here, storage part back in here. Existing classroom, new sanctuary right up against, but still enough room to have a driveway around the building. We also are proposing to not park directly on the street the way you do now, that somehow backing out into the street seems awfully dangerous to us. So. I'm sure y'all do it with, with great ease, but to us, <laughs> not so easy. We're also taking this courtyard space. Now it's this kind of sloping thing that you can't really do anything in, but when we change everything here, it actually allows us to dig it out and turn it into a very nice area to actually come out of the bottom level. For instance, out of the World Changers classroom, you could actually come out of there into a nice terraced outside area. And the same thing is true from the children's portion. They'll have windows that face out into it. Instead of feeling like you're in a basement, it's going to be, going to be an awfully nice space looking into a nice space. So there's a lot of things that, that by changing this building out, we can do so much nicer. And, and I think Larry basically said, I'm so tired of old buildings. I want something new <laughs> and something that's wonderful. So, so that, that was really kind of, kind of some of the things that, that led us in that direction, and that's what we're, we're actually proposing. But getting to the diagram, we're going to start down in the lower level, and this new courtyard that we're talking about is right in this position. You actually would come down steps from the front entrance of the church and can come directly down into this courtyard. And right here we've got world changers, and they've got doors out into the courtyard. And then we have classrooms on the other side. They have windows out. And there's actually a little kind of covered walk area, too, that, that is, is a part of that, that particular space. But getting into the diagram, essentially, if you came in the front door of the church, you would go down a set of steps, and there's kind of a lobby space that has toilets, and come down a ramp that then takes you to these larger classrooms. So just about all the children's classrooms would be the two that are directly at the end are the larger classrooms. Just about every classroom would be that size. And what we're trying to do is get kind of more kids in with a leader, but also have them age specific. And basically we have each age group kind of has their space. The other thing we do is create a children's assembly space. So not only can they have a Sunday school operation, they can bring all the kids into one room and basically have kind of kind of have church down there for the kids. And that's a large space that's kind of in the, in the middle. We'd also look to have nice AV, kind of have it to be where, where presentations can happen and a lot of different things going on. Then just beyond all those things is actually the music suite. And the diagram doesn't do justice to how big this is, that it makes the space there, it's, it's at least two to two and a half times larger than what's there. So basically, Hank, the choir can get a lot bigger. The nice part is it's directly under the area above it so that when you're practicing, you basically stand in the same place that you would when you get out on the platform in the sanctuary. It also has plenty of room for robing, for music, and a lot of other things. One of the really nice things about it is there's a couple of entrance doors that you can park kind of, kind of on the side of the building and then just come in a door, for instance, when you're going to practice. So all of a sudden it gets very easy to access this space, which, which we're always trying to do that, make things easy to access. Another feature in this building is right at the X up here is an elevator. 
and the elevator will reach every level of the church from that spot. So you only have to build one elevator to get there. And that's important because we want to connect everyone up to every level of the church. We're going to make a way that basically you can park toward the back to come in to make it the shortest distance possible if, if you're severely handicapped to get in the church. But a lot of folks will actually be able to come in the front door and just down a short hallway to get to it. So trying to put it in a place where we only have to have one but can make it to where it's the most usable. And there's a couple of ways from the music suite to get up to the main level. We have stairs on either side, so it's very easy to go, for instance, from practicing before, uh, before a, a, a worship to actually being in the space. Now, the, the main level is essentially this new covered area entering. We do have steps and a ramp to get up on this level, but this is all covered now. This is our steps that go down to that lower level terraced area. So you can imagine pretty steps leading down to that and you kind of look over a, a handrail that, that is in that area. And then the main entrance to the church, we have a large lobby because now we're gonna have a lot more people showing up. So we have to have a large lobby to take care of that. And then the restroom facilities are kind of off to the side of it. If you're going up to the balcony directly opposite the lobby is a stair that goes up to the balcony. Now we have a back hallway that connects all the areas to the sanctuary. So you can go either direction and we're not in the sanctuary so when a, a service is going on you don't bother anybody by going back and forth. It's outside of it. Once we're in we've got essentially three seating areas and what we're looking at is seating 700 on the lower level. So that's an important number, the 750. Then we have a very large chancel area or platform, and then the music for the choir behind. We also have, it's kind of raised up, but have the baptistry and the changing rooms that we'll see on the next level. But these steps on either side go basically down to the next level down, so it's very easy to get there. The steps that are in place, the current building, we also connect into those to kind of connect everything up. So, so getting around here when everything's all said and done is going to be very easy. And then once we've come in the front door and gone up the steps, we have the balcony and the balcony is seating 200 people. And actually, you come in on the lower portion, then you kind of go up the steps and across if you want to go to the back. Now, the real nice thing is that the youth who are kind of in the upper level already can come straight into here. They go up some steps that lead them into the balcony. So if they want to sit in the balcony, they go right from Sunday school right into the balcony. And, and one thing Casey wanted me to mention is that we're showing a really thick wall there. And the idea is the youth can make as much noise as they want and nobody in the worship area can ever hear them. And we've had to, we've had to guarantee that that was going to be the case because the youth are going to make some noise from what I hear. But we have that kind of easy connection for them to basically get into the space. And then we do have the baptistry with changing and dressing areas on either side. So, so again, everything's easy to get to. And just to give you another, try to connect up a visual image, this is another church we'd done, had done, and it's actually not even a Baptist church, but it does have a baptistry. But you can see the large, large platform. Also, in this case, handicap ramp to get up on the platform, but a beautiful baptistry with a rose window and just a gorgeous space. So hopefully, when, when the time comes to build things, we end up with something hopefully even better than this, but this gives you a visual of what something could look like. But basically, we have kind of finished the tour of all the things. What we're showing as new is everything kind of around here. So you can see that about one half of what we're building is, is new. 
that actually with the bottom level and top level turns out to be about 25,000 square feet. So this is a big undertaking. Now we're going to kind of take a look at some different shots just of what things could look like. And, he, and here one of, one of our things is actually the name of the church on the side of the building as you approach that you can see it's Pleasant Hill Baptist Church but in a very tasteful way. And our large covered area and we hope to see a lot of people underneath it. But we come in, we come up the steps and then we have a large entrance, large entrance lobby with monumental windows, so be a large two-story space, but hopefully make it very inviting and very welcoming to anybody who comes. And around the other side, this is also the lobby we'd kind of look through and have a large monumental window looking through. We've got the stair over here that basically a couple of things, you can go down to the children's area or go up to the balcony. Then we also did a shot of the lower level terrace just to show what that would look like. Here's the covered area, children's classroom windows beyond. World changers are off the slide to the right here, but then you also see the steps that lead up to the front entrance. So you can see folks can be kind of up at the front entrance kind of looking down into this area. So it could be awfully nice. Now, one of the most painful things I do this evening is, is basically say how much this is going to cost. That after something was $14,000 and then $379,000, I can't touch those. <laughs> now, to do phase 1A, what we're looking at, and we call this project cost, what we're trying to do is to do as, as lump sum everything you'd run into cost-wise. But we think that would be just over $2 million to build that structure on the lower level behind. At, and basically just over $2 million. Then <coughs> phase 1B to renovate the existing building, roughly $450,000. Now good old math means our phase 1 total cost $2.5 million to do everything. We see doing the second phase as being probably more than three, four, five years out. So to project the cost right now would, would kind of be telling you something that isn't going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen five years from now. So we're going to kind of, kind of leave that cost alone right now. When we get closer to when it happens, though, we would definitely want to report what we think it's going to cost. We also want to take a look at kind of timeline and schedule. What it would take to do the, our documents to do a building like this would be about three months, and then the construction phase would take about 10 months. So you can imagine in, in just over a year's time, you could be in a new building. Phase 1B would take about eight months. And hopefully what's going on is while we're building the other building, we're doing the documents for all the, the things going on kind of in the existing buildings. And eight months for construction, it seems like a long time to do some renovations, but we do have to do kind of piece by piece. So we have to move a few classes out, do the work, move them back in, then take another group, move them in and out. So we think that's going to take about eight months to do all this moving in and out and getting all the work done. So if you can kind of see how, how this all aligns, in less than two years, phase one could be entirely complete. Then to do phase two, it essentially is about a three-month document time, which would be the shortest period we could ever do it in. Probably with the amount of meetings that we're going to do, it probably would end up being six months, but the shortest could be three months. And then it would take about 10 months, again, to build this building that essentially construction folks, the size 25,000 square feet in about 10 months is doable. So, so we're saying about that amount of time. But that pretty much is, is what we're proposing, and, and there is a lot to do. We've got phase 1A, 
the Family Life Center, the renovations are 1B, and then phase two, the new sanctuary. And that's, that's what we're presenting tonight. And actually, James and I will be back on the 29th to field your questions that we hope that everybody prayerfully considers this proposal of what we're trying to do. And, and we're more than happy to try to answer every and any question you have about it. And we would encourage everybody to question this as much as they can, that, that obviously a lot of thought and effort's been put into this, but it doesn't mean everything is set in stone and, and everything is perfect and figured out. So we do welcome that to happen on the 29th. With that, I'm going to ask Casey Billings to come up, and he's got some presenting to do for us also. Thank you. What would you think? Are ready to vote? <laughs> Larry, I had no idea what you were going to speak on tonight and what you were going to read. But I was going to read from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. And six. So I think that means the Lord's in this. Uh, so I'm not going to elaborate a whole lot since Larry's already read from it, but I want to, now that you've heard what you've heard, I want to read it again. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The very first word there is trust. Are we willing to trust God? Are we willing to step out in faith? What you just saw, a lot of you are probably overwhelmed. It's a lot of information. It's 16 months worth of meetings, all compressed into an hour. There's no doubt in my mind, and I think I speak for every Vision Team member, that there is no doubt that we feel like this is God's will for our church. We would not be standing here presenting this to you if we didn't think it was. Um, so what we want you to do now, you've heard this, and we want to encourage you to come to the subsequent meetings Wednesday night. You're going to hear from the stewardship committee. You're going to hear a little bit tonight. The next Wednesday night, as Perry just said, they're coming back to do a question and answer session. So that gives you a homework assignment. We want you to pray. We want you to study. We want you to meditate on this. We want you to most importantly seek God's will. And we just pray that everybody's will or everybody's mind is in one accordance with God's will. That's what we're shooting for here. Because like I said, we wouldn't be standing here if we didn't think that it was God's will for our church. Um, we're going to try to get, I got to talk to Perry tonight. I had not talked to him yet. I got here late. But we're going to try to put what you've just seen, a good portion of it on the website, so you can go and look at it. Um, if you don't know what the website is, just go to Google and type in Pleasant Hill Baptist Church Elkin, you'll find it. So hopefully by tomorrow night, we'll have that on the website. We have, what we hired these guys to do was come up with this master plan, and so we will actually have a hard copy of the entire master plan. It's going to be in the office, so you can go by and look at it any time. We, we encourage you, you know, to, to read up on the materials and study this. Um, come prepared on the 29th to ask these guys some questions. They'd be happy to answer them for you. We understand that this is a lot of information, and you know we're, it's hard to explain every single reason that you know everything you saw was done for a reason. You know we didn't just haphazardly come up with this. Um, there's a method to our madness. Um, so just to reiterate, um, Wednesday night. 22nd, stewardship committee meeting. Everybody here be here to see how we're going to come up with the funds to do this. Wednesday night, the 29th, Q&A session, and then June the 2nd is the vote. Now, if you cannot be here on the 2nd, June the 2nd, we are going to have an early voting time. And I forgot to bring my piece of paper, Galleen, but we've got, we're going to do pretty much every time we have a service, you're going to be able to vote. Monday through Friday when the office is open, you can come by and vote. However, we would encourage you, if you can be here for the meetings, come to the meetings. And if you're only going to miss the second, wait as long as you can to vote so you can have the most possible information. Um, so we know it's a lot. We just reiterate to you that everything that you saw tonight was not taken lightly. 
Uh, it was taken very seriously, prayerfully, um, through a lot of deliberation, and uh, we couldn't be more happy with what these guys came up with for us, and uh, we hope you as a church see it the same way. I want to say just for starters, I appreciate all the work that has been done. Um, I come to you not just to speak briefly, just an hour or so maybe, um, <laughs> from the stewardship committee. Uh, no, we won't have just a few more minutes, I promise. Um, honestly, I'll say this again. I'm humbled to even be a part of this church or to be included in what's going on. But to be a part of the stewardship committee and being involved in the last few meetings we've had with the vision team, it's just been amazing. The discussions that as two separate teams have talked how much we're in unison with one another and we believe it's a God thing. We believe God is in this. And I believe I can honestly stand here tonight um, and tell you the stewardship committee believes in the need for this. Otherwise we wouldn't be having Wednesday night's meeting. Um, the committee, and I'll ask them to stand too if they will. Um, you know us all, but it's Chris Carter, Jewel Reinhardt, James Collins, and Jason Couch. God has placed us together for a reason, and all the pieces have come together, and we realize that. Thank y'all. Um, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask us. We don't have all the answers, but we'll try to find them. We're working diligently to, for ways to fund this, but I'm gonna tell you, there's already a way. We've looked at possibilities. We fully believe the money's available. If this is God's will, he will provide. You know, so many times we look at things and we think, well, that's just pocket change to some people. Well, folks, this ain't even pocket change to God. It's a lot of money. This is like the lint in God's pocket. It's that simple. It's just, it's nothing to God. We just can't limit him. Our mission statement from the Stewardship Committee says the mission of the Stewardship Committee is to give God all the glory for spiritual, numerical, and financial growth. Desiring to do so by reflecting on the past, rejoicing in the present, in resolving to do our part in faith and love for the future of the ministry of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church and the kingdom work. We pledge to do so through prayer, obedience, unity, and godly stewardship of all that he has blessed us with as individuals, families, and as a corporate body of believers. To God be the glory who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's our goal. We hope that every one of you will adopt that as your own mission statement because it's all of us in this together for the ministry of this church. It's not about having nice new buildings to enjoy, which we hope to do, but our sole purpose is to further what God has started here. That's all it's about. If we're doing it for any other reason, it's the wrong reason. But I can say on behalf of the Stewardship Committee, we believe in it. We believe that there's a, a reason to continue the work that God has started. And Chris has this a little bit to share with you. Thank you. And I want to take just a minute. I want to read just a short passage just to remind you of a conversation out of the book of Esther. It says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to this kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them to return Mordecai this answer. It says, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Sushan, and fast ye for me, 
and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. That's very important. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to that Esther had commanded him. Very familiar passage. God had put Esther in the king's favor. But she had no right to go to the king unless he called for her. But there was, there, was, there was trouble brewing. And Haman had come against Mordecai and against the Jews. And Mordecai sent a message. I'll never forget Tony Evans preaching on this, on this passage. Years ago, I heard him say, Girl, it's your time to shine. And he challenged her to make sure that she stepped out on faith. To go to the king in that day and time could cause her her life. And she said, If I perish, I perish. Folks, I truly believe that God's called us to such a time as this at Pleasant Hill. I haven't been in all these meetings. I've been in enough of them to know that the prayer's there, the work's been done, and now it's time for us to step out and to understand what God has called us to do. Wednesday night, we're going to come to you as a committee from the, from the, from the stewardship committee, and we're, and, and we're going to give you the ideas and the programs and the, and the things that we feel like we can fund this project from a lot of different areas. There's so many different ways for us to raise money, to gather money, to put this program together. So we're going to trust in God on what those avenues are. But make sure you understand something important. We're not voting on money. When you come on June the 2nd to vote, or if you vote early, all you're voting on, did these two gentlemen meet the needs of our church? It's not voting on the money. You're just voting on the project part. Make sure you understand. I had a couple people ask questions. Are we voting on the money? It's not about the money. That will be another meeting that we will have with you as a stewardship committee. We'll come to you and say, here's where we're at financially. Here's what we think we've got to do. But that's a totally separate vote. All we're voting on, have these men done their job and met the needs of our church from a facility standpoint. That's all we're voting on come June the 2nd. So with that in mind, I want the ushers to come forward. We've got something more want everybody to take home with you. And that's a magnet with a picture of the church, of the finished product. So I want one member of the family, every family, to take at least one magnet home with you. So if you'll raise your hand as of one member of your family and take, take one of these home with you, put it on your refrigerator, and pray about this project. Pray that God will give you understanding, that God will give you the confidence to say yes or no. Like I told my Sunday school class, if you haven't prayed about this and you haven't prepared spiritually for this, don't vote. Because voting no, not prayed up, could be a bad thing for you. Voting yes, not prayed up over it, could be a bad thing for you. So pray about this. And I feel like we have, I think as a church, the spirit that I feel is we're all ready. We just need June the 2nd to show up, right? So understand where we're at. And we said earlier, do we trust in God? It's what Larry said this morning, do we trust in God? So everybody's got their magnet. We know what we're doing. Before I pray, before we go home tonight, and, and I, I think James and Perry's going to hang around tonight, so you guys, if you want to say hello to them, and, uh, so they're going to be here for a little bit. Brother Danny's got a piece of information he wants to share, then we're going to have prayer, and we're going we're to go out of here rejoicing on what the Lord's presented to us tonight. So, Brother Danny. I've been sitting here tonight just uh, holding back. The Lord sent me here seven years ago last month. I have no doubt about that. He sent me to pastor one of the best churches I've ever had the privilege of pastoring. When I came, I came with a vision. I came with a vision to see this church grow spiritually and numerically. Well, God has been blessing that vision, not because of me, but because of who he is and because of you folks. The growth that we have experienced in my tenure here has been because we as a body have been prayerful. I think we've been humble. I think we've been thankful for what God has doing and what he continues to do here 
in Pleasant Hill. And I also believe that this growth has come because you people have done what I've asked you to do. If you recall, I, I lose track of time, but a couple of years ago, I, I gave you the four Ps. And I kept instilling that in you every week or from time to time. And I kept asking you, whatever you do, pray. And be very positive about what is going on here. Participate yourself. Participate in the activities and you come to church. You get involved. You stay involved. All the things that I've asked you to do, you've done that. And you've gone out and you've invited people. You've been friendly when new ones have come in. And that's why this church has grown and that's why it continues to grow. Thank God so far the devil haven't, hasn't been able to get in this fellowship. And that is my prayer. That frightens me. It is a, it's a, it is a great fear that I have that Satan somehow could get in this body and destroy, disrupt and destroy what God has been doing and what he continues to do. So I want to remind you about our enemy and I want to challenge you to continue to pray that God will keep a, put a hedge about us or keep this hedge about us and keep the enemy out. But God, through, the, through my tenure here, God has sent people that this church desperately needed. I'll never, I'll never forget, and this is just one example, and I'm not using this person for any other reason other than just the one that came to mind. But I had, a, I had a desire to see an Awana program started in this church. I knew it would go when I first came. Hank and I discussed it, workers discussed it, and, and it just didn't seem like the time was right. And, uh, but time went on, a couple of years passed by, and it just seemed like it, the Lord kept impressing that on my heart. And I said, Lord, if we have an Awana program, you're going to have to raise up a commander, someone that can take this program and go with it. And about that time, God sent us a family. And uh, they came into our church and, and got involved. And the first thing I knew, Alicia decided that she would take the Awana program. And Awana got started. That's just one example of how God has sent people, young people who have been willing to put their hands to the plow and work, and he continues to do that. I had... Five new people in, in uh, our Next Steps class this morning. I had another one that came, approached me the day after the service and said, I want to start Next Steps next Sunday. People continue to come, and God continues to send them, and they continue to join. That's a God thing. It's a God thing. And I just want to, I just want to encourage you, whatever you do, keep praying. Stay humble. Stay obedient to the Lord. And let's continue to see God do what he's been doing. And let's trust God. If these men have challenged us tonight from the word, let's trust God to do what he desires to do in and through this group of people called Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. I can never thank this vision team enough. Uh, they've sort of been handpicked. I believe that God handpicked them and place them in this position. And uh, they've worked so well together. Um, I, I can't express to you how much work, how much time, how much prayer, how much effort has gone into what you've heard tonight. I can't thank God enough for James and Perry. I believe they're godly men, and I believe they're the men that God wanted us to have. I believe that with all my heart. So I stand here tonight very emotional. After seeing and hearing the pictures and hearing the words about the history of this church and what God has done, and you know, I just like to see God do something awesome here. I really would. And I believe He can and He will if we will be obedient and we will trust Him to do whatever He wants to do in and through this group of people called Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. Well, 
having said all of that, I got an important announcement to make to you tonight. I said something about it this morning, and this is something totally different, but folks, we've had a lot going on behind the scenes. And I've been involved not only with the with the stewardship committee and with the vision team, but I've also been involved with our personnel committee. And as you know, according to our bylaws, uh, when there's a, a staff member that, that needs to be replaced, it's left up to the personnel committee and the pastor to seek out individuals to serve in those positions. And so uh, when Brad resigned and he left as associate pastor, it, it, it left us the responsibility to find someone to, to fill that position. And so we immediately began to work. And uh, we've had numerous meetings and we've, we've been praying and we've been seeking the Lord and we've been confused. We've gone through a period of confusion and, and uh, you know, we, we've just experienced a lot of different emotions, a lot of different feelings. We've interviewed several people. We've looked at several resumes. And, uh, and the neat thing is God has just brought us back around in a circle, really, to the very first person that we began to look at uh, when we started this process. And uh, we had, something had happened, a person that, that I'd had on my mind back long before Brad ever came on staff here. Um, I approached that person again after Brad left and that person told me that he was not interested, that he just felt, didn't feel led to come at all. And then after we were just about to settle on, on the guy that we we're gonna present to you, um, as our next associate pastor, uh, this person called me and said, well, I'm having second thoughts and I'd like to meet with the committee. And so we came back and we met with that person and then we were confused. I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. We were just confused. And so I, I told, after we met with this other person, uh, after that meeting, we had a, just the committee met and, uh, and I told the personnel committee, I said, I don't know why, but I said, I believe that when we have our next meeting with this other individual that we're going to meet with he and his family, we're going to have a supper meeting, and we're going to have the spouses of the personnel committee come and meet with us, and we're going to have a meeting with this man and his family. I believe somehow, I don't know why, but somehow I feel like God is going to, going to show up and he's going to reveal to us what his will is. And I said, I want you to go home and I want you to pray. And I want you to pray that God will reveal his will to us. And so we had another week to pray. And so uh, last Tuesday night, the personnel committee and uh, their spouses and uh, myself and Kathy, we, we uh, had a meeting with this young man and his family. And after, they, after we dismissed them and they left, it was like God just came in. <clears throat> We had not been unanimous. And that was one thing we said that we, would, we wanted to happen and we believed would happen if when we found God's man that we would be unanimous. And so after that meeting, uh, there was some tears shed and we were just so filled with emotions and, but we just knew that this young man that, that we had been looking at and talking with for so long was the man. And so uh, I met with the personnel committee today. I've been in communication with him and Brother Eddie, who is serving as the chairman of the personnel committee. He's been also involved in all of this process and as well as the committee. But anyway, because of calendar events and all that, and we've got so much going on, I've sort of been trying to schedule this. And so here's the deal. If we don't, if we don't allow him to come and preach a trial message next Sunday evening, then we will have to wait another 30 days before an opportunity will come before we can do that. And then once he resigns, we'll have to wait another 30 days before he can come on staff. So that'll be 60 more days because he has to give his church a 30-day notice. And so we're proposing that next Sunday evening, uh, because he is pastoring and preaching at his church, next Sunday evening he will be free. And so I've arranged a meeting with our deacons. And by the way, I'll announce that now. We will not have deacons meeting tonight, but next Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, we, we need to have a deacons meeting, and we will meet in uh, the uh, Michelle Marley Sunday School classroom. And uh, the deacons will, will be able to meet this man and his family, and they will be able to ask him any questions that uh, they feel like they would want to ask or need to ask. And he will be meeting with us, all the staff tomorrow. We are having a staff luncheon tomorrow. 
and he will be meeting with us tomorrow, all the staff. And so we're proposing that next Sunday night, he and his family will be here for the meeting with the deacons at 5 o'clock, and then he will come and preach next Sunday night and preach the service. That will be his trial message. And we will have ballots ready, and after he preaches, then we will, like y'all did with me when I came here, um, we, will, we will have y'all to vote. Now let me mention this, that there's going to have to be a slight change in, in a salary adjustment. There'll have to be an adjustment there. Uh, this young man has a master's degree. Uh, he has several years of experience. He has not only been a youth pastor, and we'll give you all this information before he preaches, but he has served as a youth pastor and an associate pastor and a senior pastor. He is currently a senior pastor in a church right now. And so this young man has quite a bit of experience. He's not a novice at this, and he has a good education. And so um, in order to, to increase uh, or, or in order to meet his needs and his family's needs, to, to bring him up to what he's making where he is, then we're going to have to have a slight increase in the budget that we had for Brad. And our stewardship committee, or excuse me, budget and finance committee, will be uh, making that recommendation next Sunday night. Along, and when you vote, you'll vote just like we did for Brad. You'll vote on, on uh, the salary package as well as the candidate. And so I wanted to tell all of y'all that tonight. I mentioned it briefly to the second service crowd this morning. I will send out a phone tree first thing in the morning. We've got, according to our bylaws, we have to send out at least a week's notice. And so um, it will be a week's notice. And so next Sunday night, I want, I want to see all of you back here. Please plan to be here next Sunday night. Let's pack this place out next Sunday night. We're going to have a, going to have a strong uh, worship time next Sunday night, and we'll give you a lot of information about he and his family. And uh, we're excited about this. He's excited. He and his family are excited about it. He has a precious wife and a little boy, and I think you're just going to love them. I think they're going to be a great fit for our church, and I think he's going to be, his, he and his family are going to be a great asset to our ministry, and I believe that where we are now and where I believe God wants to take us over the next one to five years, I believe this young man, God is going to use him to help me do what I think needs to be done. And so I want to just encourage you, be here, be prayerful, pray about this, pray about this. Please saturate all these things in prayer and be here next Sunday night and hear him preach. He's a good preacher. Hear him preach. And, uh, and then you can cast your vote, okay? God bless you. I love you all so much, more than you'll ever, ever know. And uh, I pray God's best on Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. Chris Carter is going to come now, and he's going to close us in prayer. I thank you for coming and being here tonight. And uh, please be in prayer about all of these things. I know you've received a lot of information tonight, and you've got a lot to pray about. So please, please pray. Let's stand together. Brother Chris, I'm going to ask you to come and close us out in prayer. First Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we've had today of being in your house. Lord, we worshiped you this morning, God. We honored our graduates. Lord God, Shane gave us a great challenge as a church and as to them individually. And God, I just pray tonight, Lord, I just thank you for what we've been challenged with tonight, Lord God, by James and Perry, the work that they've done, the vision team, the work that they've done, God, Lord, we're so thankful for what, you've, for what you've put together for us, Lord. We're just excited about it. And, God, we're going to go from this place just with excitement, with enthusiasm. Lord, we're going to pray. We're going to look to you. And, Lord, as we come together on June the 2nd, the boat's going to be strong. Lord God, we're just going to see you show up and show out in our church just like you have in the days past. And, God, just one thing just brought to my mind, God. Thank you for protecting my brother, Casey. God, I just, I just know your hand was on him yesterday. And thank you, God, for just putting your hand on him, protecting him, give him a, a full recovery. And Lord, just uh, thank you for all that you are tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.